a warm welcome to you all for tonight's sessional research event, which is on actuarial methods, are we serving the public interest? So I should explain to those of you expecting John Ralph to be on the panel this evening, as advertised. Um, unfortunately, when offering his services, he failed to realize that this meeting was in Edinburgh and not in London. Um, and he was unable to rearrange his diary to be here. So thankfully, Cathy Robertson, as, as chair of the Institute of Faculty's Pensions Board, has stepped into the breach at short notice. I'm grateful to her. Um, and this debate was born out of a conversation that Hillary and I had a couple of months ago, uh, when we were both concerned that scheme funding seemed to be rarely debated within the profession. And then I also saw the famous photograph of a university lecturer on strike with a placard bearing the memorable slogan, value pensions using stochastic models, not actuarial discounting rules. And you thought, there's a slogan. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I, but, but I thought, you know, what would we say to refute that? Um, so um, I would warn here, though, that we're not, we're not here to debate the university superannuation scheme per se, although it may come up. It's not, we're not, but, but funding in general, and indeed scheme-specific funding specifically, is our topic for tonight. Um, so if you want to blame anyone for being here tonight, I'm afraid it's me you have to blame, uh, but I hope you find it relevant and thought-provoking. And turning to our thought provokers, um, both Hillary and Donald have prepared a slide presentation to talk through this evening. Um, Andrew doesn't have a presentation, but is happy to give some opening remarks. Cathy has a few slides to tell us about what the Pensions Board is up to, and will also give some remarks. And once they've completed that, we'll be able to throw the, thing, the meeting open to the floor for your own contributions. So with that, I'd like to introduce our panel for the evening. Uh, firstly, we have Hilary Salt, who's a founder of First Actuarial LLP and combines national executive responsibilities in the business with running the Manchester office. Hilary's client work covers traditional actuarial consultancy, including acting as a scheme actuary, and advising sponsoring employers. She also works with trade unions where she assists in collective bargaining situations and advises on the pension schemes run by trade unions themselves. She has worked extensively with the Communication Workers Union devising the groundbreaking CDC proposal, which ended their dispute with Royal Mail. And she has also advised UCU on alternative approaches to the valuation of the university's superannuation scheme. So it may crop up tonight. Um, she also provided policy advice to a number of organizations and is the independent actuarial advisor to the NHS Pension Scheme Scheme Advisory Board. She is a member of the Council of the Institute and Faculty and has written a number of published articles and is a regular speaker at conferences. She has two sons now studying at university and is a season ticket to Old Trafford. Well, you'll be glad the Chelsea Flower Show is on this week, won't you? Um, sorry, I couldn't resist that. Um, Hilary, would you like to introduce you. what you've got? Uh, thanks for that, for that introduction, uh, Alan. So um, I, I wanted to start with what I think will be a uh, non-contentious uh, non -contentious statement, um, that pensions are a public good, uh, and our providing them, uh, or assisting to provide them, is part of our uh, public interest duty. So I, I would just flesh that out a little bit, saying that we need to be able to provide people with an income for life. Uh, this, the uh, phrase that the, the Communication Workers Union were very keen on uh, was a, a wage in retirement. Uh, people who've been used to an, an ongoing income during the course of their employment need an income in retirement. And that shouldn't just be for those with that golden ticket of a legacy DB scheme, but for past, present and future generations of workers. We need to provide that in a cost-efficient way, uh, and I would say the biggest, there's lots of other things, but the most important thing about that is that the, the way to provide pensions efficiently is to have open schemes. If you have open schemes, because money is fungible, you can use your income to pay your uh, pensioners. Uh, that means you save the cost of investing the money coming in, and you save the cost of disinvesting the money coming out. It also means you don't need to be worried about the day-to-day -day value of the assets, so you can invest in assets that are Ill illiquid or have volatile day-to-day -day values because you don't need to sell assets every day to pay pensions. And I also think it's not unreasonable for employers contributing significantly to schemes to want some payback for that investment. 
typically to be able to use the scheme to uh, recruit, retain, uh, encourage return and allow people to retire. Lots of employers are grumbling at the moment about a skills shortage, about the in inability to keep people. Millennials don't stay in employment, they say. Uh, well, clearly one way to encourage them to do that would be to provide a good DB scheme. Uh, and we should be able to help employers to use pensions uh, as a tool to help them with, with those problems. So, uh, that's my first contention. Now, uh, I would say that we are pretty much not delivering that. What we are delivering is something that I think is actually pretty shoddy. Um, DC schemes that most employer, employees are being able to enrolled into don't provide a pension at all, just a lump sum, uh, which is difficult to convert efficiently into a, a wage in retirement. The potentially efficiently, efficient uh, DB schemes we have are being run at maximum inefficiency. Uh, they're closed, so there's no fungibility bonus. They are itching to move into lo the lowest yielding assets, ones that guarantee a negative rate of return. Or they're looking to buy out. Nobody buys annuities anymore, people say, except all those uh, DB schemes that are doing precisely that. And as a final insult, many of them are tipped into the PPF, the sovereign wealth fund we might have had had we not decided to invest it uh, utterly unproductively. And by the way, the PPF isn't just funded by levies, it's also funded by the assets of the schemes entering it, and by the monies produced by members giving up benefits uh, when they enter it. There's a lot of uh, discussion about intergenerational inequity, but I think there's lots of intra-generational inequity as well. Uh, one example is when employers have made commitments to pay discretionary pension increases, uh, members had a, a valid and realistic expectation of those increases when they reach retirement, and instead of employers are using any surplus in the scheme to de-risk it, to protect their balance sheet, rather than to meet those member expectations. We've created a crisis in public confidence, snatching defeat from the, from the jaws of victory at a time when pensions are better protected than they've ever been. Instead of reassuring members that they're protected by the PPF, we tell them that to end up there is a disaster, when in reality for most workers, uh, a DB scheme and then entry to the PPF is significantly better than a, a lifetime in an inad inadequate DC arrangement. And we've created a headache for employers who are dealing with a two or, or three tier workforce, unable to keep staff and unable to get rid of staff who reach retirement with an inadequate uh, DC pot. So how do we manage to get into a position where pensions, the public good, uh, have become a massive problem for employers and employees? Uh, and I think however odd the answer, we have to look to actuarial advice uh, uh, um, as part of the answer. So I want to examine a few pieces of evidence uh, to back up that, that, that claim. So first of all, you'll be really familiar with that diagram up there on the left. That's the regulator's integrated risk management diagram which says everything affects everything else. It's all horribly complicated. I hate this diagram, uh, because in effect, it just says it's all too difficult. So you can't really do anything uh, except, of course, buy more bombs, uh, the regulator's answer to everything. Uh, I prefer my roundabout um, version on, on the right. In, in reality, I'm actually fairly unconvinced that employer covenant has any relevance to any of this. But as the regulator is very keen on it, uh, I thought I'd better give it some role. But let's assume that we can use the employer covenant to um, assess a kind of appetite for risk, to assess an appropriate investment strategy. Once we have our investment strategy, let's go the right way around that roundabout, and let's use that investment strategy to establish a prudent return on our assets and use that to set our funding basis. That's, the, to me, the right way around the roundabout. But all too often, you see exactly the opposite. You start at the bottom of that diagram. Uh, the actuary says, I'm using a guilt-based funding basis. Uh, that, you then go the wrong way around that roundabout. You say, well, of course, to uh, reduce volatility uh, against that guilt-based uh, funding basis, you need to buy more guilts. So you do that, all the while maximizing the cost of the scheme, uh, undermining the strength of the employer covenant, forcing unnecessary scheme closures, uh, and maximising the risk of benefits not being paid in full. So that's my first piece of evidence. We might call it the bloody glove uh, in this, this trial. 
So uh, my next piece of evidence, uh, GILTS Plus uh, funding methodologies. So the blue line there you'll be dead familiar with, uh, the uh, sustained fall in gilt yields with a pronounced new phase starting after the financial crash in 2008, followed by unrelenting quantitative easing, which pushes it down and down and down. Uh, the gold line there is a return, uh, expected return on UK equities, uh, established uh, starting from a, a dividend yield, uh, a quantifiable number. And obviously, if you try to assess the return uh, on equities in that gold line by adding a fixed amount to that blue line, you get further and further away from a sensible answer. You introduce more and more prudence into your valuation basis. So my second piece of evidence, the, uh, the shoe print, perhaps. Um, this, this bit's quite hard to explain in 10 minutes, which is all Alan's giving me, so I don't want to spend too much time on it. I would perhaps uh, 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 encourage you to read my uh, fairly long article in Contingencies uh, magazine. But there's a, it, there's a, we have, we're a society that's very um, negative about risk. Risk is always seen as a bad thing, which is new. That, that was never the case uh, in the past. But as well as being very uh, risk averse, We've also moved from deterministic attitudes to risk, uh, uh, probabilistic attitudes to risk, to possibilistic attitudes of risk, those kind of unknown unknowns. Um, and if the, well, that's, that kind of social change has been mirrored in our professional work from moving from deterministic models to stochastic models, which is why I don't think the, uh, the placard that Alan mentioned is, is, is right. Because the problem is, if you model 10,000 versions of the future, you remove the space for actuarial judgment. Uh, and you also remove the possibility of thinking through what actually has to happen for result 3,761 to, to come about. Uh, the fact that the, math, the math model says it's OK uh, doesn't mean that that's a, an, an outcome that's at all plausible. And I think we should be encouraging people to make sure that they can plausibly say uh, why any of those outcomes is possible. Uh, I don't think it's mathematically possible is, is, uh, is a good enough answer. It's a phrase you only hear about stochastic models, and you hear it towards the end of the football season. It's the only two uh, uh, times when people really want to believe uh, in, in, in that, uh, uh, those outcomes. Uh, just to mention very quickly as I'm passing that we have a really lazy use of the word risk. Um, when we say risk, we generally mean uh, volatility or the risk of asking the employer for more money, other risks, the risk of having to close a scheme, the risk of having to cut benefits, the risk of not making discretionary benefit increases, the risk of not paying benefits in full, the risk of members losing their livelihoods, all those risks are ignored and we concentrate on that one risk that we think is important. So that's my, my uh, 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 penultimate piece of evidence, uh, the history of domestic abuse, uh, perhaps. Uh, so finally, my fleeing bronco. Um, we need to be absolutely clear about what the legal requirements are. And the first little group there tells you, reminds you, what the legal requirements are for prudent assumptions, a discount rate based on the yield on assets held or on bonds, and mortality and demographic assumptions to be chosen prudently. Everything else is a regulator uh, addition, uh, a regulator uh, incursion. Um, and I would say that whilst, whilst those things emanate from the regulator, they're incursions that are policed by TPR's guerrilla army of professional trustees uh, who do what the regulator says, uh, whether it's the right thing to do or not. And those regulator additions include the, the push towards GILTS Plus. We're not a GILTS Plus regulator, they say. And then they turn around to me in their active engagement in a scheme and they say, yeah, but you're assuming a return on, on top of GILTS of this much. Ah, but I thought you weren't a GILTS Plus regulator. It doesn't quite seem to work. Uh, their, 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 um, their focus on employer covenants, and, and, and often, you know, they will, they will not believe an employer covenant that's been assessed by trustees. Uh, they, they produce no evidence for their disbelief. Their push towards solvency, which is the, anti, the, is the opposite to scheme-specific funding, is requiring everybody to fund at full solvency. There's no requirement to do that. And I think most shamefully, they're driving lay, good lay trustees out of the trustee boards. 
So let's just remind ourselves, a fixed democratic, democratically agreed position is that schemes don't need to be funded at buyout. And in the event of insolvency, uh, employees can rely, members can rely on the PPF, and we should stop forgetting about that. I can't resist that Michael Gove quote in full. Uh, I think the people in this country have had enough of experts from organisations with acronyms saying that what they know is best and getting it consistently wrong. Yes, we are fed up with that. So, uh, I know Alan's going to be telling me I'm uh, uh, taking too long. Let me just finally end up on this. And I won't, perhaps won't speak to this very much. But during the USS dispute, this, this, um, this phrase was really trending on, on Twitter. Uh, many of the academics saying that what the USS trustees need to do with their valuation was to revise and resubmit. Uh, and I would propose that as a profession, we need to revise and, and resubmit. Better funding advice, trying to keep schemes open, building member confidence, stop behaving as if the PPF doesn't exist, and finally, re-democratise schemes, rebuild Britain, and rediscover pensions. Thank you. Thank you for that, Hilary. Our next speaker is Donald Duval, who is a partner at AON with responsibility for professional standards thought leadership and innovation. He's a regular speaker at pensions conferences and has been president of the Society of Pensions Consultants, a member of council of the Institute of Actuaries and a member of the main committee of the Association of Consulting Actuaries. Donald's also been Australian government actuary and has advised on pension reform and regulation in Hungary, Zimbabwe, Slovenia, the Czech Republic and South Korea. Main professional interest is in the management of the overall financial position of pension funds and this requires a consideration of both the assets and the liabilities, their dynamics, risks and opportunities. And he's usually regarded as the most famous beard in pensions as well. <laughs> Donald, over to you. Thank you. I, um, I've prepared a few things to say, but I also was thinking, as far as I can, I might comment a little bit on what uh, Hilary has said, in particular the large amount that I agree with. Um, uh, where I think I probably part company with some extent with Hillary is on the causes and reasons, but that uh, pensions is a public good, um, I would certainly agree with, and the, that the system seems to be increasingly failing, I think is also an issue, and it's an issue with which we, as the actuarial profession, should uh, be engaged uh, probably rather more than we are, which is not to suggest we're unengaged with it. The way I want to, um, but the way I, what I was going to approach this through was by looking at the outlook for investment. Fundamentally, whatever the pensions, uh, uh, source of pension, uh, whatever the structure of pensions, there are only two types of money. There's contributions paid by employers and workers, and there is investment return. And most of the arguments in one shape or another come back to actually what's the position on investment return. And so what I wanted to do is actually look at what's happened in the investment world and what's, what the outlook is for that. So where can you invest your pensions, your, your money? Government bonds. This is government bond yields for many of the major countries, US, UK, France, and Germany, all down pretty substantially. So if you want to invest money for the next 10 years in government bonds, you can be absolutely certain you will earn a lot less than you would have done if you had invested that money 10 years ago or previous to that. Um, the US is probably the best. US, you're only earning one and three quarter percent per annum less than you were. Uh, everywhere else, the yields have fallen by something like three and a half percent over that 10 year period. That, therefore, for any money you choose to invest in government bonds, has a massive impact on the amount available to pay pensions. If you invest in corporate bonds, the position is pretty much the same. <clears throat> Slightly greater divergence between the US at the top and the uh, European countries at the bottom, UK in the middle, but nonetheless, very, very substantial falls of similar amount. So fundamentally investing money now, <clears throat> if you invest in gilts or corporate bonds, you will be getting much lower returns. 
and the position with equities is, if anything, worse. This is from one of the major managers, but almost whoever you take it from, expectations of future equity returns have done something of this kind of shape. The exact number will depend on the period, you, on the, how long the equity holding period is expected to be. I'll come back a bit more to what's sitting behind the equities in a, uh, in a bit, because these are fundamentally assumptions produced by experts, and therefore, as Hillary has point, correctly pointed out, it's reasonable to question them. And you can also invest if you want to take greater risk in high yield bonds. The blue lines here are the position of high yield, uh, the additional spread you get over high yield over other bonds, the orange ones are investment grade, and again, very substantially down. Illiquidity was mentioned. Most uh, managers these days will tell you the illiquidity premium is zero or possibly negative. There is a complexity premium, which is actually blindingly obvious when you see the amount of stru complicated structures that are being created. If you can actually see through those, there's a complexity premium. There's certainly people are trying with their, those structures are primarily aimed at producing highly complex illiquid products to disguise the risk sitting within them. <coughs> the UK government, by the way, participated in that and the way it did its student loan book um, when it flogged that off. So if we look in a bit more detail at equities, what we have here is the price of equities to the book value of equities. And the top line, the one that is right at the peak, is US equities, well over half the global stock market at the moment at an all-time high on price-to-book ratios. Now, <clears throat> one of the reasons why that price-to-book is important is a fairly deep value measure, but there is an argument that modern investments are actually companies today don't need to invest as much as they used to, and therefore book values don't need to be as great. But fundamentally, technology companies are created with fairly modest investment. So there is an argument the price to book may be on a long-term trend rise. But we've seen very, very good returns in equities over a substantial period. But primarily, those returns have been driven, or to a substantial extent, by improvement in profitability for relatively constant sales. People have, companies have been very successful at squeezing profits. They've closed their defined benefit schemes and replaced them with poorer DC schemes. Um, more particularly, they've squeezed wages, which have been more effective, and they've borrowed money at very low rates of interest. But However far you manage to squeeze costs, that fundamentally has, uh, it doesn't go on forever. The only thing that will enable you to get continued growth out of corporate profits is growth in sales. So actually, although price earnings ratios, which I'll show in a bit, are quite commonly used, price to sales ratio is the better measure when you're looking at fundamentally what return can we expect to get from the companies in which we invest. And that is now, as that red line shows, at an all-time high in the US markets. So fundamentally, what we are doing when we're buying equities is we're buying shares in companies which, it, which in order to give anything, any kind of reasonable measure of return, have to perform, uh, have to produce earnings, produce sales growth of a type that is very difficult to imagine and has certainly never been seen before and or effectively crush costs massively in an, on the trajectory they've already been on. Both of those seem extremely unlikely. I should be clear, I am not predicting a crash in the equity market. What I'm saying is the returns you will get by buying and holding equities will, be, will not be at anything like the levels that we used to predict or that we have recently seen. And the implications for this sort of thing are quite significant because fundamentally what we have seen in the recent past is if you have had assets, provided they weren't assets in cash, you have done very well. 
If you have not have had assets but are going to be investing in future, you will have done poorly. In fact, basically, the, the general rule of investment over the last 10 or 15 years has been invest alongside rich people, don't invest alongside poor people, and that would have given you a performance. <clears throat> Which is actually a general rule of investment, invest alongside the powerful. What uh, was mildly surprising is that democracies are in fact operating as plutocracies, not democracies at the moment. And the implications for this are not just intergenerational, but as Hillary said, intragenerational transfers. What I have here, and I'm looking at DC because I thought um, is, if you look at the projected pension a DC member might get, these two members are pretty much the same in age, but one of them <coughs> has a substantial accumulated balance, the other one has almost nothing. And this is only over a three year period, so it's quite, in the, over longer periods, it's much more dramatic, the impact. But you see that the one who has still got to move almost all their investment to do, the yellow one, their expected pension has fallen by over 5% over a mere three year period. Over a 10 year period, it'd be far bigger than that. Whereas the one who's got lots of accumulated assets has gone up substantially. And I think this is the fundamental issue currently behind almost any kind of long-term benefit provision, whether provided through defined benefit or through defined contribution, that the return that people are likely to get on, from inve on investments from the position now and on future investments is very low. And therefore, to produce any kind of decent outcome, whether a promised outcome through DB or a desired outcome through DC, you need an awful lot more contributions than people have been accustomed to paying or than people want to pay. <clears throat> On the other hand, for people who have accumulated assets and have benefited from recent performance, their position is actually they've benefited from significant wealth transfer to them and they will be assured of a pretty comfortable position. And that, I think, is the basic problem sitting behind all the pension debates about funding rates and is more important than how do you produce your discount rate or the like. However you produce it, you're still going to have that problem that you're trying to represent where future money is invested and future money is not going to earn very much by way of return. Thank you, Donald. Uh, Thought-provoking as ever. Andrew. Andrew Kearns, we have now, is Professor at Heriot Watt University and Director of the Actuarial Research Centre of the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries. He's well known both in the UK and internationally for his research in financial risk management for pension plans and life insurers. In recent years, he's been working on the modelling of longevity risk, how this can be modelled, measured and priced, and how it can be transferred to the financial markets. He's an active member of the UK and international actuarial profession including acting as editor of the Aston Bulletin, the journal of the IAA from 1996 until 2017. In 2016, he was elected as a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Andrew, over to you. So, thank you. So, first of all, just with a, a bit of additional background. So, um, I'm, uh, I declare that I'm a member of USS, so I'm uh, particularly interested in uh, how things are going to develop over the next uh, months and years. Uh, and of course, possibly some of my remarks might be colored by that fact, but I'll talk in more greater generalities. Now, I'm also not a, a pensions actuary, but I'm an academic with uh, interests that are uh, uh, partly in the pensions area, uh, and most specifically in the uh, area of uh, longevity risk, as uh, Alan mentioned. So I, I'm going to defer in the discussion to uh, my, my colleagues on many points in terms of uh, the sort of regulatory side of things, for example, but uh, what, what I perhaps might do in, in these few introductory remarks is just uh, bring up perhaps a fresh uh, sort of perspective, occasionally provocative, and not necessarily suggestions that I myself perhaps believe in, but I think there are things that might be worth talking about. So there's a, a few headings that I've got, uh, uh, point estimates, prudence, uh, et cetera, but so I'll briefly comment on those. So point estimates, so the, what we need to do for our pension valuation is to eventually come up with our point estimates. But of course, this is placing too much emphasis on just sort of one number in what can be a really a very wide range of outcomes. And of course, we need to 
think, well, is, are, are we sort of really th throwing out all of that useful extra information? Um, and indeed, our, the, these uh, point estimates that we get might well be based on a variety of assumptions which require some element of subjectivity. Prudence. Uh, so prudence goes into evaluation, uh, but it uh, relates to the uh, strength of the uh, sponsor covenant. Um, but to me, it, it, it feels like there is, and I've always thought this, uh, not just at the current point in time, but there's too much mystery surrounding uh, how the resulting margins are set. For example, how does the margin in the discount rate relate to sponsors with differing strengths of covenant or different levels of funding? What does it mean to lower the discount rate by 0.5% uh, relative to uncertainties in the balance sheet now and in the future, and the probability that the sponsor becomes insolvent. So perhaps, uh, and this is the provocative part, perhaps we should be tackling prudence in a different way. And that might, could be, say, starting first from a, a best estimate of the technical reserve rather than one that's got levels, multiple levels of prudence built in. Um, but then prudence is reflected in faster deficit reduction for, uh, for weaker sponsors, or perhaps a, a variant of what is effectively the PPF levy that charges a market rate to ensure against the difference between the solvency liability uh, or buyout uh, and the current asset values in the event of the insolvency of the sponsor. Uh, protection. So what is the regulatory balance between past and future benefits? In my view, there is not enough, uh, or, or rather there's too much emphasis on protecting accrued benefits at the expense of future accrual. And arguably, my, my overall prospects, and anybody that's a member of a, a DB plan, uh, these are, uh, and, and my prospects of a, a comfortable retirement are being damaged by excessive regulation rather than being enhanced. And so you ask the question, well, why is that? So I've got three examples. So when I started as an actuarial trainee uh, a very long time ago, pension scheme trustees had a lot of flexibility, discretion over uh, benefits that were going to get paid out. But then there was a series of well-intentioned changes in pensions law and regulations, and these were in, uh, intended to provide protection to pension scheme members. Uh, but what they did do was to protect accrued benefits only. But also, at the same time, it caused many sponsors to close their DB schemes to future accrual and to switch to DC with typically much lower contribution rates, passing on risk and lower uh, pensions. So well-intentioned legislation has resulted in worse benefits for a large proportion of the DB membership rather than better. So of course, other factors come into play. Lower yields have been uh, already pointed out, falling mortality. Uh, but the burden of regulation has played its part, in my mind, in the decline of DB. Second example, the March 2018 Pensions White Paper. To quote from that, our ambition is to maintain confidence in defined benefit pensions by increasing the protection of members' benefits. Now, this to me sounds like more of the same. Uh, the issue here is that because of the government's determination to root out the small number of bad eggs at all costs, all of us have to suffer through increased chances of benefit cuts or DB closure. So at what point do the costs outweigh the benefits of, in terms of regulation? Third example, uh, compared to regulation, uh, 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 sorry, compared to insurance, pension schemes have always had the advantage uh, of flexibility uh, over the contribution rates. If experience turns out to be worse than anticipated, you can pay more later. But then, of course, prudence creeps in. More prudence forces up uh, the, uh, forces up the short-term contributions because of our reduction in, uh, uh, say, the, the, the yields for discounting liabilities. And then, of course, that frightens the, uh, the sponsors of, of these uh, pension plans. So particularly the sponsors who are a bit weaker and have to have greater levels of prudence, that scares them even more. And again, they close the scheme. Uh, so members lose out again. And my last point is uh, just to talk about risk appetite, which hasn't been mentioned, but I think this needs to have a, a place in the discussions. So how many pension schemes really have a well-formulated risk appetite statement? 
Many will have an objective somewhere in, in their documents that, that talk about that what they want to do is end up at some very low risk uh, investment strategy at some point in the future. I think that's been uh, questioned by one of the other panelists. But what is their risk appetite between now and then? And that, that's often a bit more vague, I would say. It can't be zero because they're still taking risks. They're still investing in equities, et cetera. So can we, as a profession, develop a, a risk appetite framework that in a, perhaps in a stochastic setting that balances the aspirations of the members, including future benefit accrual, alongside reasonable year-to-year -year regulatory requirements? Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and our final panelist this evening is Cathy Robertson, who has chaired the Institute and Faculties Pensions Board since 2016. And unfortunately, as a last minute stand in, didn't have time to supply me with the biographical details for, for introducing her. But I think she's well known to enough of you, so hopefully, she needs no further introduction. actually going to say a great deal, but just briefly tell you uh, what the Pensions Board is doing to try and protect the somewhat gloomy position that my colleagues have uh, described there. And the first thing is there's a select committee meeting at the moment um, to discuss various aspects of pensions, including funding. Uh, and one of the things that Andrew particularly referred to there about the difference between a prudent estimate and a, a best estimate and how we could arrive at them um, is one of the topics that um, they're looking at, and we're hoping for an invitation to, one, to get in-depth discussions with them about what we could do. Um, so if anybody's got any suggestions, then please do send them. Um, and the other thing, of course, is the paper that Andrew and A. Hillary, I think, also referred to, which and Andrew actually correctly described as very much more of the same. Um, what we, do we want more regulation? Well, probably not. Um, but what are we going to do about these few bad eggs that we've got? Uh, and these sort of general issues like that and a number of other things are all in there. Um, so the, we always respond to consultations like this, but this one we're taking particularly seriously uh, and compiling a big response. And again, we're hoping to invitations to things like round table events where we'll get a better opportunity to present our views to them. Um, and we'll be delighted for any assistance that anybody can give us um, but generally speaking, a lot of the board's time really now accepts the inevitable that unfortunately defined benefit schemes are on their way out um, and we're really looking to see how we can make defined contribution schemes as good as they can possibly be um, and there's a number of working parties looking at that and I've just picked out a few here um, communicating risks and retirement choices. Um, is really focusing on communication and how do all the different stakeholders can communicate. There's clearly a whole lot of ignorance around about people's pensions or their interest in it isn't actually there. They're used to thinking it's something that their employer will sort out for them, but we really need a change in mindset to people take ownership of their own pension and say, right, this is, this is my issue and I need to find out about this and where we're going. Um, so that group is looking at all those things. Um, the next one is a bit more technical. They're looking at what we can do about contributions. Um, we've got a big focus on adequacy. Um, the main problem with defined contributions just now is that it doesn't have a very good reputation because the contributions paid are very low, with the consequence for the, the pensions are also low, but there's, there's no actual reason why that should be. If people put in a good contribution, then they would get a decent benefit out. Uh, the next one is all about looking at oh, across the, the globe and seeing who's got any better ideas than us, how we could compare ourselves and get most of various league tables. This is the, the modern thing nowadays. Um, and we don't usually feature very well in them, so we've possibly got a lot to learn from other people as to what we could do there. Um, this is quite an amusing one, really. Who are the old? <laughs> they try to work out who who should really be getting pensions and um, what sort of financial advice they should get. Um, the rationale for retirement behaviour is trying to understand what would influence people. 
um, and to doing the sorts of things that they need to do in order to get a better pension. Um, and behavioural finance is, again, it's a cross-party thing, but it's looking at similar sorts of issues as to how we could get people to, to take more responsibility for their own behaviours and their financial behaviour. Um, and the next one is looking at, um, really looking at products and trying to see, um, you know, there's an aspect of we failed here as actors to give them the right thing. Well, what can we, what could we change? What could we give them now um, that would be a better product for the future that would provide both good pensions and protection, disability benefits, everything. All products are in that, in that project there. Um, and the investment ones link into what Donald was saying. I mean, returns have unfortunately lower. Do you see people are more affected by that than people who've already built up funds? Um, and these, this group is trying to fathom out what assistance they could give people in making the right choices that suit their personal circumstances. Um, and the last one is looking at investment strategies, as it says there, what, what different ones we could have. Um, and the very last one is looking at aging. Um, it's an international project um, which will go on for quite a while, I would imagine. Came out with some of its conclusions. Um, so they'll all be included in the pack. Um, so if anybody wants to join those or have any ideas that they would like to contribute to us, then they can do that and through the usual channels. Thank you, Cathy. Now, the discussion's open to the floor. Um, I'm hoping it's provoked some of our uh, panellists this evening have sort of provoked some thoughts amongst you. Um, you may want to either ask, ask some questions of the panel or make your own views known. Um, can I invite uh, those who think they may want to say something this evening so engage how long to give you? Put your hand up now if you think you might want to say something. That's pretty good, actually, given the normal session of the meeting, there's about half a dozen at this stage. Is it? It's fairly miraculous. Um, can I remind you that you're being recorded for the British Actuarial Journal, and please clearly state your name when you're given the microphone. Um, you can either choose to stand, preferably stand up, please, with the microphone, or you may want to come and use the lectern at the front. Either is acceptable. Um, can I invite someone to offer us the first... Is there a volunteer down at the front here? Thank you. Um, I'm John Hamilton, I'm a trustee and I look after, yeah, I'm a trustee basically, I look after pensions. Um, God, how do you start? This is the most important macroeconomic issue affecting the country. The allocation of three trillion pounds of DB investment money. Um, and we get stuck, and, and, and this profession fundamentally has to raise its head out of its book and understand what is happening to the economy it, 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 and flight paths. And if we follow the flight path of all the pension schemes over the next 10 to 15 years, we all end up in gilts. And if we, if we achieve one thing tonight, can we stop using the word guilt but call it future taxation? And so we're going to take all the money that used to invest in the global equities, invest it in future taxation. Future taxation is paid by future people. And so if you think that your pension is a 50-year-old now, and part of the issue is most of the rules are made up by 50-year-old white people who are trying to just capture a section, an allocation of wealth, you're not. You're, if you think you're making your wealth secure, you're not. The model, and the actuaries always say, oh, it's the model. You're right. Individually, the, the problem is the models were created on a scheme-by-scheme -scheme basis when the allocation of the nation's wealth to pensions was minuscule. But the allocation of the nation's wealth to pensions now is massive. So we really need to challenge the model. And the model is, what do we need to invest in to pay pensions? What we have to invest in is things and people and those future people. 
and we are not investing in future people because we white middle class people, and sorry, Cathy, I've heard that before, it's nothing to do with education. That's a condescendingly educated thing to say. It's about education. It's not. If you're a bus driver, a train driver, a nurse, you have no idea. I've spoke to finance directors who have no idea about pensions investments. So, sorry, it's a bit of a rant. But the issue is, if, if we do one thing, let's not use the word guilt as being risk-free, okay? This nation is transferring three trillion of private investment um, equities and bonds and infrastructure over the last 15 years, and if we follow the flight path, that three trillion will go into gilts, and that gilts is future taxation. All of those assets will still be owned by somebody. They'll be owned by the independently wealthy. They won't be owned by the pension schemes. And how we fix this, this institute and the actual say, you know what, let's produce a different model, a model that invests in the future. And if that's the paradigm that you have to produce a pension funding model based on investment, that gives you a different answer. So we need to move away from the notion that guilts are risk-free and the political paradigm, do we really think investing in three trillion more in the UK guilts is risk-free? It's not. So I need to stop at some point. <laughs> but guilts, let's just call guilts future taxation. And, and last thing, gloomy. What's so gloomy? I mean, we've got record amount. <laughs> it's gloomy if you're under 50. If you're over 50, this is paradise time. You're either involved in the industry, you've got a sizable chunk of wealth, um, the regulations are saying put even more money into that sizable chunk of wealth. And great for the city, more and more investment, more, more spread off the top. It's gloomy for the young. Those future people that we need to pay our pensions, um, they won't pay. What will happen is there'll be a social revolution because they won't pay their council tax. They don't have a house, they don't have a pension. So if you really want to secure your pension, invest in the future, invest in your kids, invest in the country. Thank you. Can I, can I take another observation before we, we will we'll go back to the panel at some point? But can I, another observation, please, or a question? Mr. Martin. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Alan Martin. May I start by thanking the profession for uh, convening the debate today on actuarial methods? May I also thank the profession for the bulletins last year on the subject of intergenerational fairness. I'll come back to that, but in line with earlier comments, I should declare an interest, not a conflict of interest, uh, but an interest in advising on the USS pension valuation through my advisory work rather than my other job as being uh, a cohort of the regulator and an independent trustee enforcer. Uh, but on the main element of valuation methods, I'm afraid I think valuation methods are secondary to the valuation assumptions. And in particular, because it's the USS and in the wider public sector, may I say how some public servants in school teaching, for example, and a lot of university lecturers receive benefits in the teacher's pension scheme on the basis of an assumption, a future discount rate of CPI plus 2.8%. Please remember 2.8%. These benefits are, however, unfunded, and there's no regulator scrutiny involved. Another bit of the public sector, local government, uh, employees participating in the local government pension scheme will typically have benefits based on a discount rate of CPI plus 2.2%. Slightly lower 2.2%, but closer to 2.8% when an assessment is made of future service contribution rate. These benefits are funded, three, four hundred million, I think, a million, billion involved there, some of it in good long-term investments, but again, no regulator scrutiny, but some monitoring by the government actuary. Thirdly, university lecturers in the USS, they receive benefits costed on a discount rate of approximately gilts plus 1.7% another step down. These benefits are funded, funded prudently, uh, and are scrutinized by the pensions regulator, and that scrutiny includes consideration of self-sufficiency. 
self-sufficiency just in case society doesn't need higher education in future decades. The obvious arithmetic is quite simply lower discount rates equate to bigger deficits, even six billion in a 60 billion pound. In six billion in a USS scheme, higher contributions, lower benefits, later retirement, perhaps even inadequate revaluation of care benefits, or some combination thereof. My first point is therefore that USS members in the current debate are being penalised not so much by the valuation method, but because of the valuation assumptions, and advanced funding, and private sector prudence and consideration of self-sufficiency. So in the wider world where public sector employees might all expect to be treated equally, in the defined benefit section of public service, some are more equal than others. Thirdly, because the term public interest was in, uh, included in the title, uh, I do feel one key assumption underlying the unfunded public sector pension pensions need to be mentioned because I think they are unsustainable. I'm saying that not just since Friday uh, that I'm speaking up, but it is something I feel quite strongly about and have mentioned before. Our collective taxpayers' unfunded public sector DB liabilities for teachers, police, fire, NHS, etc., come to around 1.5 trillion. That is, yes, 1,500 billion pounds of liability, or one and a half million million, an awful lot of money by any measure. And one that conveniently, given the last speaker, isn't far away from the total guilt issuance at the moment. That's another batch of future taxation. These public sector unfunded defi defined benefit promises are made on the back of an actual assumption the discount rate, which is uh, the acronym of SCAPE. Can I have a show of hands for those who have heard of the SCAPE discount rate before? Not many, apart from GAD representatives. Um, SCAPE stands for Superannuation Contributions Adjusted for Past Experience. SCAPE it is set at 2.8% above CPI. Uh, and that, in turn, is set by reference to gross domestic product, GDP. GDP isn't anywhere near 2.8% at the moment. It hasn't been for years, and I would suggest might not be for the immediate future. Indeed, looking back, that assumption that we as taxpayers are underwriting, future taxpayers, sorry, are underwriting, has only been achieved once since the early 1980s. The bigger picture, I therefore suggest, is that we as actuaries, society in general, and let's include politicians, uh, current taxpayers, have been a party to a massive intergenerational transfer of pension debt to Generation Z. I think we should be well aware, or more aware, that um, these, or this assumption totally dwarfs anything that comes out of actuarial methods. And therefore, to take away, I suggest you challenge your local MP as to why he or she is guaranteeing future austerity. That is the size of the assumption I would suggest it is guaranteeing massive future taxation. In the public interest, I think the pensions profession and the FRC should challenge Treasury and others in government on this other national debt. Conventional guilts are mentioned, even by the Chancellor, when he is aiming to reduce the effects of inflation, but not on the other index-linked future taxation liability of unfunded pension promises. Collectively, we perhaps also should apologise to our children and grandchildren for the burden that we are currently uh, we've left them to pay. And finally, on a um, slightly no later note, I suggest that we might give the pensions regulator greater involvement in scrutinising these assumptions for consistency um, and future scrutiny across all funded and unfunded public and private benefits, uh, DB benefits. They do not currently have that remit. 
And if they did get that remit, perhaps they might like to interview the Treasury or even the DWP Select Committee on their current management or, I would suggest, potential mismanagement of this absolutely massive um, intergenerational transfer. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Uh, I will look for one more. Have we got a question uh, that, that someone could ask? And can I recommend the Sloan Prize judges thoroughly recommend brevity? <laughs> Thank you. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm Vanessa Bingle, and I work at Alpha Financial Markets Consulting. And I've spent the last six years as an investment actuary. Um, one of the themes that has come up in several of the talks has been around the shift of responsibility for sort of savings from collective schemes onto the individual. Now, I think one thing we're good at as actuaries is thinking of our product or the area we work in. You know, I'm an investment actuary or I'm a pensions actuary or an insurance actuary. Now, to better serve the public interest, should we as a profession and how could we shift our mindset kind of away from products in a silo and towards a mindset of savings for the individual. So taking into account not just pensions, DC pensions, but thinking more about what are the savings choices that individuals nowadays have, um, particularly interested for my generation where, you know, housing and whether you make a decision to invest in housing is a kind of genuine alternative to pension saving. Do we have some comments from the panel now? Hilary. Yes, can, can I make a, a few points? So the, the first one is, is just this issue around there are a few bad eggs. And, and I would just challenge that. It, my absolute view is that both Carillion and BHS are good news pension stories. Because members, even before the uh, intervention in BHS, uh, members could rely on benefits in the PPF. And those benefits in the PPF might be slightly less than they were expecting, but for most people, n not an awful lot less. Um, particularly taking into account the PPF's early retirement and uh, commutation factors. Um, so, you know, we, we, one of the things I heard on the, the radio at the time of BHS was two, two uh, shop workers being interviewed, and they were utterly aghast because what they were hearing in the press all the time was that they had lost their pensions. And, and they hadn't. You know, they had a slight reduction in their pensions because they had been protected by the PPF. Um, a, 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 a massive gain for the pensions world, uh, fought for and won by the trade union movement. Uh, and it's about time we started you know, singing its praises. It's about time we started acting as if the PPF is there rather than acting as if the PPF isn't there. And I think one of the things we need to recognise is a really sharp conflicts of interest at the regulator. And there's a real divergence between the regulator's interests and pension scheme trustees' interests. Pension scheme trustees are interested, rightly, in making sure that they pay the benefits in full, long term. But they're also interested in having continuing benefits. If their scheme is currently open, they should be trying to keep it that way. And I think that's one of the things I, you know, I would say about, just coming back to this public interest point, um, if you want to build a house, you need to hire a construction company. Um, at the moment, in the pensions world, we only have demolition companies. You know, and that's our failing. We need to have a form of regulation that allows schemes uh, to remain open. Uh, and we need to be able to provide the same kind of levels of, of decent pension provision for future generations as well as past. So just on this, I think it's really important when we talk about pensioners and we talk about intergenerational shifts. <clears throat> There's not really a difference between funded and unfunded pension schemes because pensioners don't save food or healthcare. They save a token which they will use to buy those things from a future generation. And the terms on which they buy those things will be set by that future generation. So if you've got an unfunded pension scheme, uh, a public service pension scheme, uh, the future generation could effectively tax most of that away from you. Um, and if they want to do that, that will be a democratic decision made by that future generation. 
Um, so, you know, I, I, I would agree, disagree with a lot of what Alan, Alan said because I, I do think it, 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 it misunderstands the way in which uh, future generations of pensioners buy from future generations of workers. And the best way to make that, that, that transaction better is to make the pie bigger. And the best way we make the pie bigger is by investing productively in the economy and by solving the productivity puzzle. Everything, uh, Donald, you said about um, uh, you know, low levels of return all assumes that we can't solve the productivity puzzle. And uh, you know, I agree, if we don't solve it, we're, we're, we're in really uh, deep trouble. But I absolutely believe we can solve it, and I believe that we need to solve it by doing things like letting unproductive companies go out of business. Uh, we have a very low level of bankruptcies in, in the country at the moment. We need to see that, that rise. And you know, one of the problems with MPs is that they don't like to see anybody lose anything. And some of the stuff in the, in the white paper is about more regulatory intervention to restructure businesses to make sure that you know, people, the pension schemes don't go under. Let's not restructure those businesses. Let them go. You know, so we can build thriving new industries, uh, which are not just financial services businesses, which are things that make things, uh, grow the pie, and allow our young people now to have a lot uh, more to look forward to uh, in, in the future. Just on this point about um, education, I absolutely agree that you know, ordinary working people should not need to engage more with their pension, should not need to be educated more about their pension. They should just have a scheme that works. I don't need to know how my car works. Nobody tells me I need to engage more with my car. Uh, you know, I just need to take it to a garage, let them to fix it, and back on the road again. And we need to be able to provide that same public service to people who need pensions. And any, other, any other on the panel? Donald? You? Yeah, I must admit, Hilary, I didn't expect um, you to be describing Carillion and BHS management as not bad eggs. But um, uh, though I do understand the point you're making about the members' uh, benefits, um, uh, just a few brief comments. I'm not too worried about the flight to Gilts, firstly, because it's not as big as people think. Um, because, for example, when you do buyouts, there's usually a move away from gilts, not towards it, because gilts are normally paid into the insurer and the insurer doesn't invest the whole in gilts. And secondly, the gilt market has a substantial participation from overseas, which means that the pricing, I don't believe, is the thing is mispriced, because if it was hugely mispriced because of UK demand, the overseas investors would flee, and they haven't. Um, <coughs> and I think as long as we have an open market, that's um, reasonably uh, satisfactory. Um, I'm not going to comment on any of the specifics of the public sector schemes or the USS or anything like that. Um, one comment, though, in, comment in relation to the pensions regulator and their concern in general about self-sufficiency, most pension schemes last significantly longer than the employers that set them up. That's by no means true of all, but it is true of the great majority. And therefore, that's why that's a concern which any pensions regulator has to bear with, has to consider. Um, and on the um, engagement issue, Hillary, I agree with you in a perfect world, and sorry, I strongly agree with you. I think that all the emphasis of trying to make people understand things as opposed to having something that just works is the wrong direction, and we should say so. But at the moment, um, well, firstly, at the moment we have that problem, but secondly, actually, the issue identified is that actually what people need to work is the entirety of their financial position, uh, the housing, the pensions decision, uh, and the whole lot. And people, and saying we need to educate you uh, all these bits separately definitely makes it impossible. I think that issue of how actuaries engage with individuals, we built our skills on collectivizing really difficult problems and therefore we're enabling us to apply more brain power and more calculations. The only reason we do valuations every three years is because the calculation effort was so infernally difficult. Any sensible regulatory structure now would not be built around a valuation cycle at all. Um, <coughs> the, it's only for history we have that. I think that's a, um, an incredibly difficult problem and one well worth trying to solve. There are a small number of actuaries around the world in various countries trying to solve it. I'm aware of some in Australia. Um, and I think they're making progress. 
um, I've seen some very effective descriptions about what reasonable benefit, uh, what a reasonable level of benefit means in the terms of, of which you can live, like how many holidays a year can you have, how, of, um, how often can you eat out in terms that are actually meaningful, and then doing the, actually that's the meaningful description, what's it mean financially analysis behind the scenes, but it's very difficult and very worthwhile. Andrew? Uh, just a couple of brief thoughts. So the, uh, the, the first comment there about the, uh, the macroeconomic approach, I mean, I certainly uh, agree with that. I think that uh, we're in a, currently in a situation where the DWP and, and, and associated bodies sort of micromanage the pension side of things where totally in isolation from everything else that's going on. And so therefore the response to that is to make sure that the, the government itself does, uh, takes a more macroeconomic approach and decide, well, what do we want? How do we want this money to be invested and to be productive for the economy and then to uh, uh, you know, essentially manage the pension system in a way that, uh, and regulate it in a way that encourages that rather than punishing risk taking. And, and but for example, and, uh, there are uh, the, the bigger pension plans such as USS. I mean, they're, they're very able, at least while DB stays, that uh, they're very able to uh, invest in illiquid investments and infrastructure. And uh, if we ended up in a position with no uh, 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 DB schemes in the, in the worst case scenario, then who's going to, where's the money going to come from for the infrastructure, big infrastructure projects? Uh, PPF, yes, I, I agree, that's a very good thing, and we, we just need to make sure that the right levies get paid, but at the right level. Do you have anything you want to add, Cathy? No, I, 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 that's good, because I want to go and get another question. There's a, a hand desperately up at the back there. Thank you. Uh, Carla Morelli, University of Dundee. I should declare an interest here. Not only am I a member of USS, I'm also um, a member of the University Colleges Union and one of the negotiators for, for UCU members on the USS Joint Negotiating Committee. So I was involved in the negotiations around this dispute. And I'd like to make a few points, not primarily about USS, but generally. First thing is that I think the dispute has created a clear indication that there is an overwhelming support for continuation of a pension scheme which gives secure benefits. And in terms of the discussion about educating people, well, university employees now are, I can tell you, extremely well educated on pension schemes. And they have given resounding views on this without a shadow of a doubt. And I think that speaks to a general view, uh, much wider than in higher education, and that is that there is a real demand for security in retirement and a, and a demand for certainty about what is happening to individuals' pension contributions. So I think that's the social support, the support for social provision, I think, is, is overwhelming. And I think that's extremely important. So let me make it just a, a couple of points that I think are worth looking at. One is that I think there is... Um, uh, again, a consensus in this discussion here around the ideas around secular stagnation, Thomas Piketty's work in terms of the growth of assets over the growth of income. But I think that's, that's highly problematic. It's not, sir, that's not a foregone conclusion. That's determined by a set of social decisions. And again, I, I would support what Hillary has said there earlier about the need for investment in newer technologies. Um, and the conservativeness of pension schemes in pushing things like action over climate change and innovation, because that's where the growth will come from. It will not come from the stagnant economies and the stagnant technologies. And therefore, I think the issues around investment, active investment decision-making rather than passive decision-making of investors is extremely important in this process. Um, and around things like climate change, I think that's one of the key key issues. Um, the final point I, I just want to make is the issues around um, QE and quantitative easing. Because again, that's something that's not been discussed here at all tonight. And if we want to talk about the wealth transfer and intergenerational inequality, the impact of quantitative easing is exactly what has driven that process. 
It's not actually people's desire for pensions. It's not their desire for certainty in terms of pension provision and retirement. It's actually government policy over the way in which bank, the banking and the financial sector were rescued after 2007, 2008. That is what has driven much of these changes. So I think there, there is a, some big questions here to be resolved, but I think there is some responsibility. And in terms of pension valuation and assumptions, one of the areas where the USS dispute has arisen from, and I agree with one of the last speakers, the issue around assumptions, not simply discount rates, are fundamental to this. The inconsistency in application of assumptions in the USS case is one of the areas where major, dis major disagreements exist. And I think the way in which assumptions have been built into the USS valuation has created the biggest dispute we've ever seen in higher education. And part of the blame for that lies at the door of actuaries and USS itself. And I think that's one of the key things to come from this. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> we have another question. There seem to be more people putting their hands up at the start than there were <laughs> people asking questions. Any other volunteers? I think that's someone escaping. <laughs> Ronnie? You're not allowed to win your own prize, though, I'm afraid. Thank you very much. Um, I hadn't intended to say anything, but I would like to let this end without exposing the, the elephant in the room, which was referred to, I think, by Alan Martin in the enormous amounts of final salary pension liabilities that lie behind the, or the, the, the root of the problem here. And um, I, I think we need to have far more practical common sense in the, the profession. We had the opportunity 40 years ago to move more towards career average revalued benefits, which are far less onerous. And I know we certainly got vilified for contracting in and building our schemes around that for the clients, whereas the vast majority of the profession in the industry kept the final salary benefits and contracted out of what was um, ultimately uh, ill-fated and, and was disallowed. So I think the problem is partly of, of the industry's own making because the benefits were f far too generous. You, the career average you valued is far more sensible. And if only that had been done more widely, we'd have had less of a problem. It doesn't take away the, the problem that, we, that faces us today. But um, so let's try and get back to some practical, commonsensical advice on benefit structures. Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. Um, is that encouraged? We have one down on the front left here. And it's probably going to be our last contribution, so remember the brevity requirement. Hi, it's Melissa. Um, the topic of your um, event for today is are we serving the public interest? Um, as actuaries, we've traditionally been heavily involved in defined benefit schemes, and the fact that actuaries aren't really involved in the design of future benefits for the future generation, I guess my question is, are we really serving the public interest there by saying that, well, actuaries are not really needed to play a role in DC design? Thank you. That's the shortest one we've had tonight, and that's popular. And I'm going to insist on the panel giving us a very short answer each. Yes or no, are we serving the public interest? Uh, well, I, I would say uh, lots of the work we've been doing on trying to find a way to introduce collective DC is, I, I, I think, really important. Uh, postmen all, 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 all understand pension schemes as well as uh, university lecturers know. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that's somewhere where we can really make a difference. Um, uh, wearing another hat as director of the Actuarial Research Centre, I can uh, point out that a, a, a colleague of mine and a, a, a co-researcher of hers at City University are working on a, a, a project that is sponsored by the uh, profession through the ARC, which is looking at redesigning pensions, which is all about risk sharing. and. Uh, 
doing something different, but it's uh, not DC, not uh, DB in its classical form. So we are in one bit of the profession certainly doing that. I'm sure we're doing a lot more as well. Cathy, do you think we are serving the public interest as a profession? Or could we do better? I think we are, yes. Um, we've also, if I'd been better prepared, I would have mentioned a group that we've got looking at collective DC as well, so it might be interesting to have a conversation about it sometime. But, um, but I think that the short answer is yes. <laughs> Short answers are what we're liking at this stage with only about four minutes before the end of the meeting. <laughs> Donald, are we serving the public interest? Um, I think there's a danger that um, uh, in people trying to find alternatives to DC, bearing in mind that a substantial proportion of the population always has had and always will have the majority of their benefits outside state, state benefits coming from DC. DB provision in this country peaked at just over 50% of the population. Remember, DC has always been the most important part of pension provision. Thank you, Donald. Now, can I invite David Bowie, who's been sitting in the front row taking a few notes, to say a few words in closing? Uh, yes. It's a bit of a challenge, to be honest. It, was, uh, it, it started off with, uh, with Hillary sort of slightly um, leading us astray by, by offering something non-controversial. Uh, before, before kicking off a, a debate, which uh, I, I think was absolutely splendid, because I, I had worried when I saw the title and when I, when I knew it was about pensions that we were going to subside into a, into a long technical debate about discount rates, which would have been a right throwback to several decades. Um, but, but the fact that I think that we started actually engaging with some of the, kind of the, big, the bigger issues was, was something which uh, I, I, I think was, was excellent and attested me, thanks very much to, to the panel. So where Hillary started us, um, she, she referred to us, I think, as losing the plot at one point uh, in, in our response to uh, getting pensions right uh, and, and was very much of the, the view that we, we'd lost track of, of, of keeping pensions open because it's only with an open pension that there's going to be any, any fungibility of money, any, any spread of wealth uh, within, within society. That's at least what I took from that. Uh, and she offered us, I think, three bits of evidence which suggested that we had lost the plot. Uh, the, the bloody glove, which I, I'm assuming was the, <laughs> the, the regulator's picture, um, uh, which uh, encouraged us, in, in, in her words, to, to think about the problem in the wrong way uh, and, 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 to, and, to, and to not look at, look at the bigger picture, which uh, her much simpler uh, diagram had. Uh, she offered us falling guilt yields, which, which was a, a theme echoed very strongly by, by Donald in, in his, his contribution. And then I'm not quite sure I got the lazy, the, the, the third point, the, the third bit of evidence um, but I, about the difference between possibilistic and probabilistic uh, attitudes to risk, but that sounds like something worth uh, exploring in a little bit more detail. Um, I, I, think, I think the point made, being made there was, was that perhaps we were over-engineering some of the the, the analysis of, of smaller risks rather than looking at the bigger picture uh, in, in order to come, come to some sensible conclusions. Uh, and she finished off by um, not being very polite about experts. Uh, so I, I don't know where that puts us, but uh, we've lost the plot as well there. Um, Donald uh, took very much more of a, an, an investment perspective. Uh, it, was, it was really gloomy. Um, <laughs> the, 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 the picture that he painted uh, with, with uh, falling guilt yields, falling expectations on, on, on equities in, in, in his mind, uh, the, the, the absence or the disappearance of quite a lot of the other premiums like illiquidity, which uh, pension funds have relied on to date, um, all of which uh, I think led him to, to conclude that, uh, again, taking a slightly bigger picture view, that, that the people who already had money were likely to keep having money and it was going to be really, really difficult for those who didn't yet have money in order to accrue that, that wealth and to be able to compete and, and operate in the same economy in a, in a, in a, in a sensible way. Andrew's um, picture um, uh, was, uh, was, 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 was fairly similar, I th thought. So it picked up some very similar themes in the, in the, in the sense of um, by focusing and by encouraging through some of the methods, I think it was kind of the first bit where we started touching on, on some of the actuarial methods, 
Uh, so, so some of those things uh, in, in, in terms of the way in which we do our calculations had led to a loss of flexibility and encourage further regulation to be imposed on schemes, uh, all of which were, to, again, to protecting the wealth that had already accrued rather than uh, wealth which might accrue in future to existing generations, let alone future generations. Uh, and he made the, 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 the comment there that perhaps some of this was also about overcompensating for, for a few bad eggs, which, was, which popped back up later on in the, in the discussion where, uh, where, where perhaps the bad eggs were actually good eggs in disguise, uh, in the sense that it, 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 it revealed the, the fact that there were some protections for, for, for pension schemes uh, in place already. Uh, Andrew also encouraged us, I think, as a profession um, to, to, to perhaps think about a, a wider risk appetite framework that we might think about in order to, to, to try and frame our questions and our advice to pension schemes, um, and, and that, that may be something that we can pick up um, and, and might, might, might flow through, hopefully, to, to some of the projects which uh, Cathy Robertson introduced us to that the pensions board were already picking up. It was kind of, a, kind of a quick scamper through all of those projects, but uh, uh, it, it looked like they, they, they sort of were, were at least covering m most of the issues, but perhaps a, a challenge there for some bigger picture pieces in there as well that, that, that would be helpful for us to, to pick up as a profession. Um, and, and, and Cathy also invited anybody who was really interested, I think, to join and help out in some of those projects, so perhaps I can echo her advertisement there. Uh, the discussion was lively, um, which uh, I think we, we were surprised by the number of speakers, or at least Alan was, which, uh, <laughs> and, and, and then and the, yeah, the contributions kicked off in, in fine style. Thank you, <laughs> John, who, uh, who I think also just re-emphasized, I suppose, the, the need for us as a profession to look beyond, beyond the books, to look, to look up and, and look at the bigger picture in terms of the macroeconomics of it all. Uh, again, made the point about too much protection about accrued wealth uh, and, and encouraged us strongly to, to, to refer to guilds as future taxation, uh, which is certainly something that's gonna, I'm going to think about uh, a, a, little, a little bit. Uh, and, and that phrase was picked up again by, by Alan in, in his comments about uh, uh, the unfunded schemes effectively also kind of echoing that, that taxation on, on a future generation, or at least this generation further down the track maybe. Uh, and, and talked a lot about the inconsistencies that existed uh, across the, um, the way in which funding and protection existed in, in, in different pension funds, ostensibly all within the public sector. Uh, I think I heard you ask for the regulators to provide more scrutiny on, on things, which might have a mixed reception. So. Uh, there's uh, further questions then on um, whether when, when, when advising individuals, whether, whether actuaries can take a slightly bigger picture for them as well. So it's, it's not just macroeconomic level, but also in, in, in advising and, and providing advice to, to individuals who might, might look for a, a slightly more holistic approach, just to throw that word in. Um, and, and we had uh, lots of responses from the, from the panelists there as to, as to how things should work. Uh, sorry, let's do um, uh, further encouragement that, that pension funds should be things that, that, that do just work, that, that it should not be something that, that members have to become educated about or engage with particularly. I, I like the comment about not having to engage with your car. That, that, that resonated. It's, uh, um, and and I'm, I'm sure that, that, uh, that, that, that is something that we as actuaries uh, should be able to, to, to work on. Uh, further comments? Uh, uh, again, for uh, well, just uh, the, the, the echoing from the, the USS experience. Um, ag again, for you know, schemes that provide secure pensions, but, but also a, a stern encouragement that, that pension funds might be one of those sources of funding for, for, for actually driving the productivity which is needed, I think, to, to uh, leverage us out of the, the rather gloomy future which Donald had, had origi originally set out, that, that we need something new and something sparkling, really, to to change uh, what, 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 the, um, what our ability to generate uh, wealth for future generations, let alone in, in, um, in pensions, will, will, will be required. Uh, and Ronnie finished with, oh sorry, Ronnie, Ronnie suggested that, that uh, actuaries at, at a more um, uh, granular level could become much more advised. We'll, we'll need to focus again on, on getting involved uh, in, in structuring the benefits in a better way. And I think that echoed some of the points about 
perhaps actuaries can get back into being the, 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 the role of constructors in this industry rather than dem demolition experts, which, which I thought was another uh, good, good comment to, to echo on. Um, and Melissa finished with um, uh, a question, a challenge, I think, to the panelists to, to actually answer the question uh, that they've been set. Um, <laughs> I think I got one or two answers from it, but I think the tone of the answers was generally, generally positive, or at least that we could serve the, the public interest uh, with, with a little bit more focus and perhaps uh, uh, keeping, our, keeping our heads up out the books, as, uh, which seemed to be a phrase which echoed a couple of times, uh, and making sure that we do look at that bigger picture uh, rather than just focusing on the technicalities of it all. So I'd like to join the, the, the other speakers, um, thanking the panelists very much. Uh, it was an entertaining challenge trying to scribble all of that down on the way through. Um, but but it, it, it was a, it was a, a real um, breath of fresh air to get, to get a, 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 that sort of different type of debate uh, when applied to pension funding compared with so many that we've had in this hall and similar in the past. So thank you very much.